Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Madam Moore Cronin, and today we are joined by Eric Sue, founder, investor, podcaster, and author of the forthcoming book, Leveling Up, How to Master the Game of Life. Eric, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Madam Moore. Awesome. So I love this concept of treating life as a massive multiplayer RPG game. And I've been listening to your podcast for a while, but for people that aren't familiar with this concept of leveling up, how would you explain it to someone? And how did you come up with this concept in your own life? Yeah. Um, and so I used to play games growing up. So, and I, and I started to get really competitive. So I, I started doing esports before it became a thing. And um, that's when I realized that I was learning a lot of the skills that I was supposed to be learning, whether, you know, playing sports or, you know, going to school or whatever, maybe not school so much, but, you know, in sports, you learn about teamwork, you learn about communication, resilience and all that stuff. And I was learning it through gaming. And so what I started realizing there was that gaming was really the moment where I started to realize if I practiced and if I interacted with the right people, I would get better and better. And I would, I would slowly level up in the game. And I was like, this is, this can easily be applied to, to real life. And I always thought to myself, because I'd wake up every day super excited to play EverQuest or, or World of Warcraft or whatever. Um, but I always thought to myself, look, if I can just have this type of excitement for something in real life, I'd be set forever. And, you know, you fast forward to now, business is the ultimate game for me. And there's so many aspects I can play around it. Uh, but I, I wake up with genuine excitement every single morning. Um, and it all comes from the gaming world. Um, but I think there's a there's a stigma against gaming because, you know, they think it's a waste. Most people think it's a waste of time. Um, but the funny thing is, if you if if you look at sports, it's the same type of stuff, right? You know, again, teamwork, resilience, communication, all that type of stuff comes from sports. And sports is actually a game. People just don't acknowledge gaming yet, just like they didn't acknowledge Bitcoin in the beginning. They didn't acknowledge Snap in the beginning. Everything is kind of dismissed as a toy initially until it becomes really serious, right? Same thing with Discord, the the chat program. People used to dismiss it, and now it's now it's a really big thing, and now it can actually compete with Slack, right? So yeah. Long story short, there are levels to everything that we're doing, whether we are uh, we are working out, whether we are learning how to meditate, whether we are playing the game of business, or even in our career as well, we have to climb the ladder. So there's there's levels to everything. Yeah, totally. I do find it interesting that gaming gets vilified in this way, in a way that, like for instance, Netflix seems as totally normal and people don't tend to talk about how much you're wasting your life by watching all these Netflix shows. Whereas game is, is actually much more interactive. And like you said, you have, you actually learn things by doing and you try different strategies in order to see what works and what doesn't. So why do you think there is that, the sort of the vilification of video games as compared to other forms of media? And do you think that'll shift over time and eventually it'll be seen as, as more useful way to spend your time? I think people dismiss things that they don't understand as much and things that are trending upwards. So let's use Bitcoin as an example right now. It's at 38K or maybe could even be up to 39K right now. Um, you know, back in back in March or sorry, April, it went all the way down to, to 3K and then it popped back up to 8K. But my, my point of saying all this is that, um, you know, things get dismissed over and over and over. Um, you know, Warren Buffett dismissed it. Jamie, uh, I think it's Jamie Diamond from, um, or it could be Dixon from from JP Morgan, um, but they dismiss it. And they, eventually what happens is they laugh at it. Eventually they will come around to it. Right. right. And so that's the same deal here. I think that's what gaming is. Um, people just don't understand it because they could never really tie in their life experiences with it. Um, but then when you use the sports analogy, because I've been doing a lot of podcast tours. So, you know, I'll, I'll just turn it around on them and ask them about, hey, like, have you played sports? Why did you like sports? What did you learn from sports? And I'm like, great. Apply that all to gaming. And they're like, oh, OK, I get it. Yeah, totally. I also I, I think before we get into sort of the how you can think about leveling up and how you can. Uh, do better in the game of life. I think starting with a goal is important. So how does one win at the game of life? Because in a video game, it's very clear if you win, you get the max number of points, you're at the highest level. But in life, it's it's maybe not as well defined. So how would you define winning in the game of life? Yeah, so a couple things. When I think about success, success is being able to work on what you want to work on every single day. There's a sense of freedom around that. Um, and so, you know, if you have that, 
but in most cases, I think you'll have you'll be able to you know build a, a life of freedom. You'll be able to build a life of wealth. When it comes to playing the game of life, it's a never-ending game. It's better to look at it as a game that uh, you can use the word infinite game, which was popularized in 19, the 1980s. But you're it's a cliche, but you're supposed to enjoy the journey, right? Keep if, if you keep playing end games where it's like, oh, we got to reach this goal and then we're done. Well, what happens when you reach the goal? Then it, it's so unfulfilling, mm-hmm. right? Usually what happens when you set a goal and you reach is like, oh, okay, this is what it feels like. And then you then it's like, okay, that doesn't feel that, that fulfilling. But if you cont- if you have a long-term mindset where it's like, I'm just going to keep playing until I, I die that when, when it's game over, then good, right? So I think it's important to have, uh, kind of to your point, your, your question, to have a long-term vision 10 to 25 years out, could even be for your life. Right. And you can have a one year goal as well. And then you can have 90 day goals, too. I think it's really important to set up goals like that, but also understanding that um, you're not you're not there's there's no end game. Right. Because there's an end game. I mean, there's, you know, typically those people are are more, I would say, small minded. And typically those people are a lot more short term thinking. Right. Short term profits, short term profits. You got to think long and you got to understand that, you know, here's a Bill Gates quote. Most people underestimate what they can do. In a decade, they overestimate what they could do in a year, right? And that that's largely true. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I love you. You bring up in the book about having an apprentice mindset or a beginner's mindset. So it's always day one in your mind. And a lot of the tech companies tend to think that way. And that's why they're able to stay so nimble amidst all the changes. Whereas you bring the example of Kodak, which wasn't able to reinvent itself every day. So how should someone think about having a a beginner's mindset and, and what is what's the real risk of becoming too much of an expert and potentially having yeah. a curse of knowledge that's a great question i think one one reframe you can do is to always think of you like i'm speaking about myself i always like to think of myself as an idiot so oftentimes i'll be like what what are you talking about right and, and I'll, I'll feign like I, i'm i'm and in some cases maybe i am an idiot it's like the socratic but, method yeah and so in Clubhouse right now, the, the the chat app that that's kind of taking off, um, I go in there and um, you know I'll, I'll largely be listening, and um, you know I have an open mindset, so I have you know strong views loosely held, right, and just being very open and then always trying to learn and understanding that I really don't know much, um, and that there's that there's so much more to learn, and you know there are some people in in Clubhouse that you know sure they've done well uh, financially, but they've got a, a sense of arrogance, a, se- a sense of ego around them. When you start to have that you start to close yourself off, right? So as, as much as I can, I try to be as humble as I can, understanding that there's just a lot more to learn. And uh, that's why one of the core values at um, you know my, my companies is is growth, right? Growth in, in terms of, um, you know, trying to improve my my mind, my mental health, and also, you know, physically as well. And also trying to help my team grow and also trying to help the, the world grow, right? And if you were to ask me, you know, what's the overall vision? Well, I have this ultimate goal. And I'll never accomplish in my life. You talk about, you know, working with uh, the Howard Marks. Um, my goal is to level up the world because I just love learning and I just love teaching, right? But that gives me something to wake up for every day. And I'll, again, we talk about the infinite game. I'll never, ever accomplish that. Um, yeah. And Howard Marks, the founder of Activision, brought this up. I had him speak at one of my my conferences. Um, and he was like, look, my goal is to help entrepreneurs reach their dreams. And then the room kind of got silent. And he's like, so you guys get silent, but that's what a goal is. So. Mm. Yeah, it also reminds me of Elon trying to colonize Mars and he just became the world's richest person. So I think there is a lot of power in that and just having a, a big goal that you're moving towards. Yep. yep. I am curious, it seems you brought up the importance of having good physical health, eating well, taking care of your body. And this reminds me of one of my favorite subreddits is r slash outside. And everyone there thinks about life as this massive RPG game. And I just want to read the top post that got it all started and get your reaction where he says, a few months ago, I I was playing a survival game in game. I was repairing my clothes before hydrating, getting a full eight hours sleep. Then it occurred to me, why don't I do this for myself in game? My character wears the best clothes. I get the best of my abilities. I stay hydrated, but in real life, I'm not doing that. So why is it that some, especially gamers are so good at staying committed to a game, but when it comes to real world, they aren't able to get that same motivation. Is it because the real world's just more difficult to level up or, or why is that? No, I actually think, um, you know, when you're playing games, you're in a shadow world and the shadow world allows you to train. Just like when you're playing sports, you're, you are learning a lot, you're training a lot, but you got to carry it back over into real life. 
I never connected the two. And so me, I was very confident in gaming. World of Warcraft, going on raids, playing Counter-Strike, these types of games, right? Um, but when push came to shove, what, real life, I'm like, how can I translate those skills? I'm just not good enough. I didn't have the confidence to do that. But part of me writing this book is, is really for my younger self saying, hey, look, all the skills you got, gaming actually creates leaders. It creates success. You can actually translate those skills over into real life. And if you want to play the ultimate game, you can play business, right? The, some of the, the best, you, you mentioned Elon. He used to play games growing up, yeah. right? Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg used to play games growing up. Um, one guy that used to play Quake, his name's Dennis Fong, um, known as Thresh. He used to win Lamborghinis, Ferraris, and all that. He used to win tournaments all the time. And he, he started a couple successful companies in the gaming niche, uh, sold a bunch as well, just super successful, right? So to your point, thinking about things such as uh, like an RPG, there's, there's your Twitch reactions, you're a lot faster. How you think about things, you're a lot more systematic. Um, so you actually do have a net advantage over the quote unquote normal person. Um, because I'll, I'll tell you this, I'll share some numbers with you. Um, I move a lot faster because of games. So you talk about Twitch reactions. I talk a lot faster, which is not necessarily good. Um, <laughs> but I type a lot faster too. So at my high point, you know, I can go up to 144 words per minute. That's not to brag. That's just to say I got that from gaming. You, know, yeah. you just naturally train that up. So. Yeah, no, I listen to podcasts at like 2, 2.5 XP, yeah. so I definitely like that as well. Uh, it also seems like, you know, you talk about in your book how at a certain point you had this aha moment where you realize that you can apply that same framework of gaming to life. And I think digital marketing was the thing that really initially got you interested and made you sort of apply that mentality. And I mean, I also run a marketing agency, so I also am very... Uh, it's very compelling to just see the numbers, have very clear results. Do you feel like part of why it's so compelling to you is because there are such clear results now with e-commerce? Like, whereas maybe if you grew up in the 50s in the Mad Men era, like, do you think you would have been as as compelled by marketing? Yeah, I, I think it's tough to say because, you know, neither you or me have lived in that era. Um, but I would say right now we're lucky, um, you know, it, to, to be able to measure, to have to put in inputs and see certain outputs, like that's great because you you get that validation in games, right? Um, but you know, if, if you were to put that put us back in those times, I still think we would have survived and thrived because at the end of the day, it's a mindset type of thing. So I think mm. the gamer mindset is something um, that you can probably carry over into into any era. Totally. Now, a lot of the listeners of this podcast are you know millennials, Gen Z, people who are still trying to figure out how they're going to make an impact on the world and live a life worth living. But obviously the trajectory is way different now, even from when you and I were in elementary school. So how do you think about like the traditional trajectory that used to be like go to school, get good grades, work for a company for most of your life versus now where, you know, I've heard you talk about the importance of building your own one man media empire, sort of forging your own path in the world. What advice would you give to someone who's maybe 14 or 15 or, or just trying to figure out what they should do in life? Yeah, I think so. One thing that's important to me is equal opportunity. So when I think about when I think about education, right, some people might say, oh, there needs to be equal outcome at the end of the day. I, I think that's that's not the best because that's going to disincentivize people from from working hard. You want everyone to have an equal starting line. So that's something I'm very passionate about. Um, and I think, you know, as long as as long as when I think about all this, when I think about leveling up, people growing, it's about how you're programmed. It, it's about how how the information that you're taking in is, is affecting your actions, right? So I think that's very important, giving people the right uh, information to act on, and then they can make their own decisions, right? Because even though you or, you or me, uh, you and me, we, we have businesses, um, and I think that's certainly the best deal, it's not necessarily the fit for everyone. But to help mm. everyone understand, like, hey, th these are the options that you have, so these are the power ups that you have in front of you, or these are the armor, the, you know, the armor and weapons that you have in front of you. You can kind of pick your poison. You want to be a sorcerer. You want to be a barbarian. You want to be like a necromancer, whatever. Right. I'm just making things up right now from Diablo. Um, <laughs> but the, the point is, um, getting people up to that point to understand that, Hey, these are all the things you can do. And, um, not limiting them, right? Because I think right now what's happening in education is that we're limiting them. We're not teaching them about taxes. We're not teaching them about wealth creation. Uh, we're not teaching them about networking. We're not teaching about sales or marketing, that type of stuff, right? These are all very necessary real world skills uh, that you actually gain from business. And then from there, once you have your tool belt, like your Batman, 
you can decide what you want to do with it, right? But if you keep you, if you keep playing the game, you're going to keep compounding leverage, um, and and that's actually a big piece of it. So four forms of leverage: you have code, capital, labor, and media, right? So everyone wants to become a YouTuber, a TikToker right now. That's media. Mm-hmm. That's building leverage. Look at Charlie D'Amelio. Look at Logan Paul, Mr. Beast. Great examples. Um, labor is hiring people because not ev- not necessarily everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. So labor is leverage because then you can go do other stuff. Um, code, right? The labor can build the code, and the code can you know, can work while you're sleeping. Um, and capital, you got to have capital too, right? But um, you know, you can do these in any any way that you want. But a lot of people now, what I would say is, if you're 14 years old or so, you want to go towards building that the media empire, and that typically takes two to three years to start to build. You look at Mr. Beast; he didn't get anything going for the first four years or so, and then he kind of just exploded. Um, but that that's four years overnight success, right? Right. So anyway, that's a mouthful. No, yeah, I mean, it takes a lot of time to get that success. And I think most people get disheartened when they post their first video and they don't get any views. And it does take a lot of time to compound. And I love the part of your book where you talk about habits and how a positive habit, getting 1% better every day, really compounds over time, just like how the value of Bitcoin compounds or code or media. Um, But also negative habits also compound and you can get into a, a dark rabbit hole if you start to think negatively and have a... A, you know, a, a scarcity mindset. So how do you think about building the right habits? And what would you say to someone who's in that sort of downward spiral that might help yeah. them get out of it? I mean, I, I was in that downward spiral before. So, you know, when I went to college, uh, all I did was play World of Warcraft and I played poker. I, I never went to school and uh, I played World of Warcraft till 3 or 4 a.m. And then I go to Carl's Jr. and get a $6 guacamole burger. So huge burger. And I get the chili cheese fry, so extra fries, and I get a large raspberry iced tea. And then I eat that and I go to sleep. Terrible. And I wake up at 1 p.m. again and start playing. So I was in a downward spiral. So even though I'm talking about games, we can we can come back to this. But you 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 don't want to overdo it when it comes to anything at all, right? I clearly overdid it. Um, and so I felt like I was good for nothing. I mean, I had six withdrawals my, my first year of college and like, a, like two Fs or something like that. Um, so that was probably at my lowest point. My, my credit score was really low. It was like 480. I was in debt, like 25,000. Um, so I, I was seen by a lot of my peers and by my, my, my parents, um, as the ultimate failure. And, um, you know, I'm sure some people have had it way worse, but that was the work. That was the bottom point for me. Um, but what I would say is this, right. Kind of relating to your question. Oh, if I'm 14 years old and I post something to TikTok and, um, I don't get anything and most people tend to give up there, I would say, Stop being so selfish, right? Stop being, <laughs> stop thinking about yourself so much, um, and just understand that you're doing this as a reframe your mind into thinking, you know, I'm doing this as a learning experiment. I'm gonna keep learning. I'm gonna keep getting better. And I know that this is probably a three year journey to get there. And most people aren't willing to do this, but I'm not most people. And then you stay consistent. You learn. You focus on learning as the KPI, growth as the key performance indicator. And uh, no doubt you can get there. My my opinion is if you're healthy. If you have a good mind, you have a good good body, you know, around you, you should be able to, you know, you should be able to reach success. I think, you know, Mark Cuban always says, if I can do it, you know, as a billionaire, you can do it too. Um, and I, I certainly think so. Yeah. And when you're gaining those skills and learning new things, do you tend to favor a more generalist uh, philosophy where you want to be pretty good at everything and maybe you're really good at one thing? Or do you do you favor more of a specialist? Like you should really just try to be like the best in the world at this one, two thing or this intersection of a few things. I think when I was younger, in my early 20s, I wanted to do everything because I thought I was talented enough to do everything. So I was like, oh, I'm learning this marketing stuff. Okay, now I'm going to, I started learning SEO. Then I started learning paid media, email marketing, conversion rate optimization, all that stuff. And then I'm like, I, I should probably learn coding too. And then I should learn design as well. Uh, but I think it's really important to to focus. The more you focus, the faster you're going to get success. I'm not saying you can't do all of them. Um, I will say for me, when I took over my my one of my businesses, uh, Single Grain, um, I started creating all these other businesses. You could certainly do that, but it was just, it was just going to take you longer to reach success, right? And you do have to be. Um, it doesn't matter how talented you are. It's just going to slow down your growth. So it depends on what you want to do. You're better off combining everything into like one focus and going a lot faster. Yeah. That's like a kind of like a T-shaped talent stack. Yeah. Uh, and what would you say? So we talked about the perspective of if you're, you know, 14, 15 year, years old, just getting started. But what if you're in your 40s and 50s and maybe you had a, a career trajectory that sort of no longer exists and now you're trying to reinvent yourself? 
What would what advice would you give to someone who's a little bit later on in the stages of life as how they can continue to level up even in those later stages? Yeah, I think going back to the the beginner's mindset or the apprentice mindset, um, understanding that age is just a number. Because even right now, I still feel like a kid. Um, so I, I'm in my, my, my 30s now. But um, look, it's it's the same thing. Um, and you know, when I talk to my parents, by the way, they're thinking still the same. I, I'm just like, yeah, at the end of the day, age is just a number. You're going to gain some more experience. You're going to gain some more knowledge. But you know, let's look at, let's use, uh, so Jeff Bezos didn't start Amazon until he was 30. Um, and then you have uh, Jack Ma started Alibaba at 35 or 40. And then you have, you know, Colonel Sanders, right? Way later. Walmart was way later too. I think McDonald's was the guy that stole McDonald's, Ray Kroc, um, and made it successful. I think he was in late 50s or 60s. So there's really no excuse at the end of the day. Um, you have, you had the um, Nebraska Furniture Company, Furniture Mart, that uh, competed with um, Warren Buffett bought them. But that original founder, she worked till she died. Like, in, I think she was like 100 or so. So oh. it's a never ending game. It's just, if you see it as a, as a game, it's game over for you, then like, you know, that's what happens. That's what your mind has told you. Then your mind tells you to stop taking action. You stop taking action and then you just get to rot away. But I mean, you either choose to keep going or you rot. Yeah. It also seems like certain games can be played longer. Like Warren Buffett, all he needs to be able to do is read and, you know, yeah. his mind needs to be somewhat clear, but might be harder for like a pro football player, you know, if they'd chosen that path. Well, here's the thing. I mean, let's use LeBron as an example, right? I mean, right when he signed his his deal, um, so he had a choice when he was 18 years old to sign with Reebok or to sign with Nike. Reebok gave him a, a contract, $10 million. We're going to give you $10 million, but you got to sign the contract right now. The deal is worth, I think, $110 million. Um, he ends up saying no to that one, chooses Nike for $90 million, right? The point is, A, he had a long-term mindset. Even at age 18, he had already started to do these business deals. So even as an athlete, you can see him now. He's planning ahead, right? He's 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 got um, multiple investments. He's he owns you know equity in a lot of different things. Um, so I, I think athletes are are like they're learning now that it's it's important to um, think about what happens after the sport. Yeah, totally. I'm also curious, you know, before we get into some some rapid fire questions, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts on just like the nature of reality. Because to me, it seems like it is this kind of choose your own adventure game in life. And the more you strive for things, the more things sort of become attracted to you. So how do you think about this law of attraction? Or, you know, a great example is with space travel, where landing on the moon was a huge achievement unlock. Colonizing Mars would be an even bigger achievement. And it almost feels like if we took a spaceship out into the ether like we would find like achievements would appear once we st like reach out to try to grab them but i'm curious if you have that same kind of inclination or just how you think about reality it is i mean it's um so i do see life as an mmo so when i'm waking up um you know i'm, I'm acquiring all these skills and then you know eventually you have to go kill a big dragon and you get the loot right and then you move on to the next thing um so you know e even this this book launch by the way like getting getting the books out. I saw the books downstairs, um, you know, physical books. They came in yesterday and I'm like, wow, this is, this is actually really happening. I'm actually doing physical books. Right. Or when I launched a software company, or even when I took over single grain, um, it's like, these are all little achievement unlocks. And I, in my, in my head, I'm imagining that I'm earning these badges along the way. Right. Mm. So it makes it, it makes it more fun when you're doing that. Um, you know, my bike back here, there's badges all the time. And then, um, you know, there's, it's, it's certainly gamified, which keeps me doing it more. So, um, I think it helps at least for me. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's get into a couple of rapid fire questions. So first question is about AI. I'm curious when you would predict that we will achieve artificial general intelligence. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen for the if we're lucky for another 15 to 20 years, I think even oh, we're getting assistance with AI right now. You can see AI is assisting with, you know, managing ads, um, you know, predicting what you want to be typing or even, you know, coming up with captions, you know, using GPT-3. Um, so I think general intelligence is a whole nother level. And I'm not qualified enough to say what I'm, my guess, if you had, if I had to pick something is 15 to 20 years out, because I, I don't think that's an easy thing. Okay, next question. What is the best way to build a following so you're not so dependent on any one platform? Yeah. So I would say if I, I, if I had to restart today and I had nothing, uh, knowing me, because I like to teach, I like to learn and teach, I'd probably start with YouTube. 
Uh, reason for that is because YouTube's algorithm is pretty good at picking up uh, titles and, you know, what matters most is your title and your thumbnail. And obviously you got to have good retention as well. Um, and then from there, I would take, you know, all the content I'm creating on YouTube, convert it to audio, um, you know, hire some writers from like pro bloggers uh, and then, you know, kind of go on the channel. Right. So I might I might go, you know, video to um, podcast to blog post and then start to repurpose for IGTV and all these other channels. But just I, the idea is I have one seed piece of content that I can sprout out into all these other types. So yeah. um, maybe if I'm resource constrained, I start with the seed piece of doing that for like a year or two. But as I gain more resources, I gain more traction, then I can start to sprout it out. I like that. And next question is about automation and the potential loss of jobs. You know, there were a lot of jobs lost during the pandemic. I'm curious how concerned you are about the potential mass joblessness in America and around the world. And if you think UBI is a good solution for that, or if you have other solutions, or do you feel like there will always be new jobs created, uh, you know, whether it's social or, or otherwise, how do you think about that problem in, in the world? So, that's a very meaty question. That's a good question. Um, I, I think a like I mentioned earlier, we have there's a lot of reskilling to be done. So I think um, we we gotta no matter what um, as a society, we can't just rely on the big colleges out there. Everyone needs to do their job to get everyone to the an equal starting line. So then we can all strive towards equal opportunity. Um, I think I I UBI is something that might become necessary because. Um, you know, there's this concept of having a useless class. I think it's the, mm -hmm. the book is, um, I think it sounds like you've read it 21 questions for the 21st century. Yeah. You've all. Yeah. So the idea here is that like, if there's a useless class, you're going to have to pay these people. The problem is if you pay people, if you give them a UBI, it might disincentivize them from going out there and creating value. The other argument is they might have enough on their table to go try things. Right. Mm. Um, I, I don't know yet. Right. I, I think there's maybe one country that's tried it. I mean, we're, I guess in the world right now, we're largely doing a UBI experience, but you can see what's happening. It's disincentivizing people. It's creating wrong incentives where people actually choose to take unemployment, um, to collect, you know, even, even if it's a little bit less money to not go to work. Right. And so the problem right now, as we're recording this early 2021 is, um, we are seeing a supply shock and we are seeing a demand shock, a demand shock at the same time. So little production, and then you have little, little, uh, little demand as well. And so, or so, sorry, little supply. And so then what's that going to create? Who knows what's going to happen in the next one to two years, but I bet you there's going to be hell to pay. And so I think remains to be seen with UBI. What I would prefer to see, at least what I can control is just to help people level up as much as I can and then see what happens there. But, um, I think the world is going to change quite a bit in the next, you know, let's call it two to three years. Yeah, I agree. Uh, next question is about extending longevity, because one of the main differences between a video game and the real world to me is that in the real world, your avatar decays and grows old and more feeble as you get older, whereas that's obviously not the case in the video game world. So how bullish are you on extending longevity and like how long do you think someone born today could live? Yeah, I mean who knows what's going to happen with, with technologies in the next, you know, 20 to 50 years or so. But if I can upload my stream of consciousness into a robot and just keep going, maybe that's the only option, uh, at the end. Uh, I don't know, but it seems like there's been progress made around kind of, um, supposedly like reversing aging or slowing it down mm -hmm. considerably. So I do think we're going to live longer. Um, you know, I don't know if in our lifetime we're going to be able to solve death or aging, but, um, I'm hopeful. So would, would you upload your mind if it if it came to that and that was an option? I think it depends. I think right now it's probably easy for you and me to say we would do it. But I think maybe if I'm 80 or 90, I might just say, hey, if it's my time to go, it's my time to go. So, um, you know, right now, yes. OK, next questions on Bitcoin and decentralization. I'm curious how much you think Bitcoin and DeFi is going to transform the financial landscape in the coming years? Yeah, I, I think it's a foregone conclusion now. Um, uh, you know, there's obviously in the back of my mind, there's always risk, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, what if what if it, there's a 51% hack or something like that, and, you know? And, and so, mm -hmm. um, but you have all these large institutions putting in money and you have some of the smartest people in the world, you know, putting 98% of their net worth into it. Um, I, I do think 
you know, also when you think about the blockchain, just in general, you are scaling trust just across the board. And when you scale a trust like that, um, I mean, finance is, is inherently a lot of it is is all about trust, right? You can do deals a lot faster. Everything's transparent. I just think the world's going to move a lot faster. Um, you know, thinking about education for a second too, um, being able to see all the degrees that you've completed, all the certifications that you've completed um, on a blockchain, um, using that as a resume. I think there's a lot to do, right? So I'm very bullish, um, at, at least on the blockchain side, with Bitcoin because they're the they're the number one horse, and then um, Ethereum because yeah. there's a lot you can do with it. I mean, Ethereum, you know, it, it looks like it's coming back to where it was a couple of years ago. So I'm very excited for that. Totally. All right, last rapid fire is on free will. Do you believe that we have free will? How do you think about volition? Yeah, I actually, I mean, I actually wouldn't even know how to answer that. What, what, what do you think about it before I kind of craft my thoughts? Yeah, I, well, you know, Sam Harris has this argument that there is no free will, but mm -hmm. I kind of feel like, yes, if you take all of the things that are outside of your control and add them up, you, what's in your control is going to be a very small sliver. But I don't yep. think you can discount that sliver. I think all of those slivers added up is is what moves the collective in a new direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not informed enough to, to, to speak on it, but I would say what you said makes sense. I mean, I largely feel free when I wake up. Yes, there's a lot yeah. of constraints. Like I'm in downtown L.A. right now um, and it's, it's definitely not as safe as it used to be. Right. And so what do I do? Well, I'm going to you know, I still have free will to ride this bike over here. And, and work out in the morning. Um, so I think you have to adapt to your environment. All right, let's get into the future scenarios. Worst case scenario. What is the worst case scenario? What are you really concerned about over the next, let's say, 10, 20 years? Um, I think America is going to become a socialist uh, country. Socialist, communism. I mean, that's what I worried about. Um, and the reason for that is is this. I think um, I was listening to a podcast the other day. You have a couple of smart investors talking. Um, it, it actually makes a lot of sense. When you have democracy, you have a lot of progress. And what happens when you have that progress is the gap gets bigger and bigger because the people that have the asymmetric upside, they just keep getting stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. So it's an unbalanced game. And when you haven't, you know, I, I've played games where things are unbalanced. People start to complain. The crowds get rowdy. What ends up happening is, the pendulum swings towards socialism and communism, right? And then it balances out again and it swings back towards democracy. So I, I think it seems to make a lot of sense. I'm not too informed on this, but intuitively I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense right now. There's mass inequality. The country's very divided right now. I, I think it's guaranteed that, you know, Bitcoin will, will, will fly. Um, I, I think the other thing I'll say too is um, I think, you know, the world is going to be led by China and India moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, probably the, the, the U.S. will drop to number three or number four. Um, we'll see what happens. Well, let's turn it around with the best case scenario. What is the positive vision of the future that you see as a possibility? Best case scenario. This is not the best possible version, but I think what's realistic is if we're if it's not just the schools putting in the effort, but you have people that are, when you have, you know, billionaires like Naval Ravikant, you know, doing podcasts on how to get wealthy. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's the responsibility of quote unquote successful people to be teaching so we can get everyone as many people as we can to an equal starting line. Right. I think uh, then, you know, we're going to see a net gain across the board because everyone complains about education. Education is broken, education, this education, that. Um, so I think we all got to do our part. I think, you know, if you've been fortunate enough to get into a position where you're, you're successful, you know, how you, you have, uh, you have wealth. I think it's on you to, to to give back, and so I'm very hopeful on that. I'm I'm very excited what happen, to, to see what happens with blockchain kind of education technology. Um, and for me, again, I, I just love I just love learning and I just love teaching, and um, I think it's a very interesting problem to solve because you know we're we're all human beings, and um, you know again going back to Mark Cuban's quote, you know if I can do it, you can do it, right? So, finally, the the most likely scenario. Most likely scenario. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, net net, I think humanity is just always going to get better. Um, you know, we, we're always growing, right? Again, it's, it's you know, the Tony Shea quote is 1% better every single day. And um, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful. I mean, look, we have, we're going to have a lot of progression on the blockchain side, robotics, um, you know, human, 
we're talking about sequencing, D DNA sequencing, all that type of stuff, right? Um, electric cars, I think there's going to be a big focus on climate change for sure. Um, so I think a lot of great things are going to going to happen. And, you know, oh, on the education side, obviously, too. So everything's trending the right way. I mean, we have freaking, you know, people going to Mars, too, right? So, um, you know, humanity is just going to continue to kick ass. I think it's just a little bump in the road right now. Any final thoughts for listeners or where can people find you? Yeah, I think the last thing I would say is... Um, you know, I would recommend, look, if those of you that play games, um, learn how to play poker and learn how to get your butt kicked all the time because poker really teaches resili resilience. It teaches you a lot around business, too. So I think poker is a good um, training ground to get into business. And uh, in terms of where to find me, um, you can go to levelingup.com. Um, and then you can also reach out to me on Twitter or Instagram at Eric O S I U. Well, thanks so much, Eric. I really love the book. It comes out on February 24th, and you can pre-order it now on Amazon. Yeah, thanks again, and thank you to our listeners. Thank you. The past, the present, and the future.